Okay, hello, we're back uh, again today talking about Abraham. I'm going to continue with the life of Abraham today. Um, we covered a little bit about Abraham's life on um, the last teaching. We went into uh, how one of his tests, his first test, was the separation between him and Lot, his nephew, and how you know some people will just can't leave the things of this world to, to follow Christ. I mean, it takes a calling. You can't just decide. If you look in the New Testament, um, some people came to Jesus and said, I'll follow you, Lord, wherever you go. And let me first, one of them said, let me first go bury my father, then I'll follow you. Um, you know, for one said, let me first go and say goodbye to them that are in my household. You know, let me let me live out my life, you know, and wait till all my kids are gone before I follow you, more or less. That's not what he said, but... Um, but some few, unless God calls you, unless the calling on your life, and and, and uh, no man no man can come to Jesus Christ unless the Father called him. It's not something you can just decide to do on your own. But Abraham was called of God to leave his land and his father's house, and to follow a voice, uh, follow the Spirit, the leading of the Spirit. And some of the promises we're going to go into the next um, test of Abraham, which will come in uh, Genesis 16. Um, this first test was separation of him and Lot. Well, the first test was to leave everything behind and to trust his voice he was listening to and that uh, God was going to do everything he had promised him. But the second test will come in Genesis 16 uh, and it's called Hagar and Ishmael. And so God, uh, Abraham's test was whether he would believe, he would have faith, that God would, would do exactly everything he promised he would do with him. But that he would do it by the power of his Holy Spirit. Working in him and through him. Same thing with us. We have to trust that what God has told us he would do for us and to us. He'll do it by the power of his Holy Spirit. Working in us and through us. And not by any good works we can do. Uh, not by deciding, oh, this is what I'm going to do for God. Um something in my own strength to help God out. You know, uh, God doesn't need our help. All he needs is us to listen to his voice and follow and let the Holy Spirit lead us. Okay. And let me see what was the promises to Abraham. Now, now remember, we're, we're uh, always going back from the Old from the old to the New Testament. Because the Old Testament, the Old Covenant that God had with Abraham you know, we're going to cover the life of Abraham, Isaac, his son, Jacob, then Jacob being becoming Israel, and his name being changed to Israel, which is the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he began with Moses. He started the Old Covenant with the laws and the Ten Commandments and hundreds of laws in Deuteronomy of what you can eat, what you couldn't eat, uh, different festivals, feast days they had to keep. Uh, offering priesthood with sacrifices every time they sin. This was old covenant. You know, God even had him, had him build a building, uh, the tabernacle of Moses, then the Solomon's temple, which is all visible, all something you can see with your eyes, you can touch with your hands, all something that you have to try to perform in your own strength, like keeping the commandments, keeping the laws. Everything was visible. That's how God started out, restoring this thing. Remember, I'll teach it. I'm not drifting away from what I'm, my uh, theme of this whole Bible teaching is, is on the restoration of all things. Um, God started out restoring man with, 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 with Adam had uh, given up, forfeited in the garden, Adam and Eve. God began to slowly restore it. And he started out with a prototype. You know, a prototype is something... Um, like a car, let's say. They'll build a prototype, just what they want it to be or want it to look like. And most of the time, that prototype doesn't work exactly right. Uh, so they work out the kinks, and until it's finally they get the finished product. But the prototype always has flaws in it, usually, uh, until they work it all out. Now, God didn't make, he didn't make the old covenant with flaws. In other words, you know, I, I can't get into all that right now, but we're going to get into that when we cover, you know, Israel and Moses and, and all the laws they had and the, the old covenant with the priesthood and everything. But God was not, that was not his intention. It's what man wanted. 
prototype was to show man that what he wanted, uh, which is just a religion, uh, like all the other nations had, so God gave it to him. It's not what he wanted when he came, took him out of Egypt. We'll get into that later at a later time. But uh, when he took him out of Egypt, he wanted to be a God to each one of them. He wanted each one to hear his voice. But they, they, they said, no, Moses, we don't want that. We're afraid to hear God's voice. You, you go to God and hear God, and we'll do whatever you say. That's religion. You know, you, know, you pick a man, a preacher, a priest, and you, you hear from God, and you tell us what he wants, and then we'll listen to you. And, but this is what they wanted, so God gave them what they wanted. And it's a prototype to them, to man, that this doesn't work. And they finally got fed up with it, and when Christ came, they were ready to have a real relationship. But I can't get into all that right now. But anyway, what did God promise Abraham? You know, the old covenant, uh, the old promises was just a prototype. It's about, it was all about visible, visible things that God was going to do. The new covenant in Christ is all an invisible thing. In other words, the Spirit, you don't see. The Spirit works in us. The New Testament covenant, he did away with the old, where it's an invisible body of believers. Uh, the, the church is invisible. It's people from every denomination sometimes, from every walks of life, that God uses to listen to him and do his will. It's not a one particular denomination in one particular place in one building. It's people out in everyday life who hear him and do his will. That's his church today. It's not a building. In the Old Testament, it was, a, it was a particular group of people called Israel. And it started with Abraham. So God's promises to Abraham was in, in 12. We read that last week. 12 verse 1 and 2 and 3. He tells him to get out of his country and his father's house. And I will show you to land. I will show you. His first promise was, verse 2. I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. I will bless them that bless you, and curse them that curse you, and in you of all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you. And then the second promise to Abraham was in Genesis 15, that he was going to give him a son to carry on his promise, that, that he would inherit, uh, he would become a great nation, a great name, he would, all the families of the earth would be blessed through his, his nation. And that he would also, the second promise, well, let me say the first thing. second promise is promised land. He would inherit Canaan land. Um, that is in chapter 15, verse 7. He said, God said unto him, I am the Lord your, that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And that was Canaan land. We call it the promised land. So he was going to give him a promised land, a land, Canaan land. And the third thing he was going to give him was a son. And verse 15, 1, fear not, Abraham. God said, I'm your shield and your exceedingly great reward. And Abraham said, but Lord, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my, <coughs> of my house is Eleazar. In other words, he thought he would have children through his servants. And Abraham said, because Sarah was barren, she couldn't have any children. And they were getting up in age. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. So he told him he was going to give him a son through Sarah. So that was the three basic promises. So the second test of Abraham was, uh, he was getting up in age, and Sarah was getting up in age, and... They, hadn't had, they didn't have any children yet, but God had promised them seed after him. Because he gave them this land, and he needed children to inherit it after him. And so, but he was childless, you know. They were, I mean, they were getting up into 100 years, close to 100 years old, and they still had no children. So he gets this good idea in chapter 16. This was the test. Are we going to wait on God, be patient and wait on God for what he promised us? Or are we going to try to do it? in our own strength. And Abraham, you know, couldn't wait any longer. So, verse 1, chapter 16, Sarah, Abraham's wife, bore him no children. And she had a handmaid who was an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, this is before their names were changed, God changed their names. Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray you, go to my handmaid. It may be that I may obtain children through her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai, 
And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he waited ten years. Ten is the number of testing. And he couldn't wait any longer. So he gave her to her husband, Abram. I'm going to call him Abraham. Because later on in chapter 17, God actually gives him the name. He changes his name from Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah. Uh, in Revelations chapter 3, Jesus said he'll give us a new name. He has a new name for all of us. Our old name is our old nature we were born into. The new name is the new nature he puts in us through the Spirit. Um, so he gave her to her husband to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarah said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid unto thy bosom. And when she saw that she conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. So, Abram, I mean, uh, so they couldn't wait ten years. And they waited ten years, and that was it. I mean, God promised them a child, but... He, you know, he must have forgot. So, uh, we're going to make this thing happen on our own. So, Sarah says, here, take my maid and have a child with her, and this will be your your seed after you. So, the name of the child was Ishmael. You know, you've heard the term, oh, this is my Ishmael. Or this is my white elephant. Something you wanted so bad, you couldn't wait for, and then when you finally got it, you wish, oh my God, what did I do? I'm stuck with this. So, they were stuck with this Ishmael. Because they could not wait on God. So that was the next uh, test of Abram. And he failed the test. But I mean, we all, you know, when we come to the Lord, He puts us through tests. And we're going to fail some of them. But uh, God keeps working us until we pass them all. And I want to just, remember, I, I, I keep going back to the New Testament. You know, the New Testament is about our body, soul, and spirit. He's rebuilding this, this, this temple. We're His temple. And I believe at one time I had, had read all the scriptures in the New Testament. There's five or six of them talking about how we're God's building, we're God's house, we are God's temple. You know, uh, it's no longer a building made with hands. We're His temple now, and He's restoring us, our spirit, soul, and body. So He gives us promises. He gives, He gave these three basic promises to Abraham, and in the New Testament, it's it's a shadow of what we're going through today. Uh, God is dealing with us, not in visible things that we can see, but invisible things, it was things that are happening inside of our spirit, soul, and heart. What did he promise in the New Testament? I want to touch on some of those just to compare to Abraham and how we must wait on God and be patient for him to carry out the promises he has promised to us. Uh, the first thing God promised is that in 2 Corinthians 5.17, says, if any man be in Christ, so when you come to Christ, when you surrender to him, he is a new creature. Old things will pass away. Behold, all things become new. So he, he begins to make a new creature out of us. Remember Abraham said, I will make your name great. He makes our name great by being a real Christian. What is the greatest name but Jesus Christ? And when we become a true Christian, you know, I called myself a Christian for 26 years of my life because I went to a uh, Christian denominational religion. But I was not a Christian. I mean, a Christian, you know, people think Christian means somebody who believes in Jesus Christ. No, that, that's not it. A Christian is someone who walks like Jesus Christ. You know, in the New Testament, when, when they saw someone walking, you know, Jesus had passed away in the book of Acts and risen and, and started the new church. And so when people saw the uh, disciples of Jesus walking just like he walked, you know, healing, doing miracles, you know, hearing the voice of God and carrying it, and God, you know, performing his his word through their through their word. Uh, they so they, they must have been with Christ. They they're true Christians. So a, a true Christian is someone who walks the way Jesus did when he walked on earth. And I, I was not a true Christian until I gave my life to him at 26 and he filled me with his Holy Spirit which is the second promise in Acts 2 38 and 39 uh, Paul says this is when they got filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 verse 1 through 4 was the first day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the first apostles and disciples so there was 100 and, 120 in one room 
and the Holy Spirit came on them like it looked like a, a tongues of fire and it came upon all of them and they began praying in new tongues and prophesying and from that point they went out into the whole world and preached the gospel with power with the gifts of the Spirit and with power and in verse 38 37 when all those who heard them praying in tongues everybody had come to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost there were thousands of Jews there and they heard this commotion going on and Peter preached to them saying that they had crucified the Lord of glory and they said what must we do then to be saved and he said repent in verse 38 and 39 repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit so this gift is the promise the second promise and as he says in verse 39 this promise is for you and for your children I want to read specifically what it says this is important to know for us these promises that are for us today as the promises were for Abraham in the Old Covenant repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call remember I start out by saying he has to call you he has to put in your heart a, a, a true repentant heart and you come to him and surrender and then this promise he has for you is the Holy Spirit it's for you and for your children just like Abraham the promise was for him and for his seed after him so our promise is he's going to make us a new creature he's going to change our nature to where we can walk the way Jesus Christ walked and not just go to a Christian church the second promise is the promise of the Holy Spirit that comes in us with gifts and power and because of this gift and this power he puts in us the third promise is in Matthew 5 14 says you are the light of the world you are a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid so he makes us a light of the world even as he made Abraham he said all the families of the earth shall be blessed through you and through your seed through your nation in the New Testament all the families of the earth all of our neighbors are to be blessed by the light that's in us you're the light of the world that's the third promise he is making us a light of the world not through good works we can do you know listen you know religions are caught up in all kinds of natural works uh, you know building soup kitchens to feed the hungry uh, you know and hey look if your neighbor's hungry go buy him a hamburger I mean there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and Christ expects that you can't expect to see somebody starving and just pass by him but that's not the light of the world I mean the lost person does that you know I mean the, 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 the pagans the heathens if they see his neighbor starving most of the time they'll stop and buy him food so that, that's not being a light of the world that's just common sense you know that's just uh, and, and you know and also religion builds all these great big hospitals in their names to heal but Jesus said go out into the world in Mark 15 and verse 16 through 20 go out into all the world and preach the gospel and lay hands on the sick and I will heal them and the Lord work with them doing miracles and so he sent us out to heal the sick you know he didn't send his church out to build hospitals but this is all good works that are they are caught up in but that's not the light of the world the light of the world is the power that Jesus Christ put in us through his Holy Spirit that makes us a new person a new creature and we become the light of the world these are the promises now we can't make these things happen in our own strength like Abraham after 10 years just wasn't he didn't see this he didn't see himself being a great nation he didn't see himself having any seed after him uh, and so he tried to take in his own hands to make it happen and sometimes you know I got involved in so many volunteer work when I first came to the Lord thinking well I mean you know I want people to see that I'm doing something so I, I got caught up in volunteering for you know, uh, United Way and volunteering for prison ministry, things that God never called me to do. Um, but letting people talk me into it, kind of like Abraham let Sarah talk him into, you know, look, take my handmaid and she'll have a children because I can't. But um, so I had people talk me into things, but I'll never forget, you know, um, I was at a, a, the last prison ministry I went to. I woke up one morning and 
there over there and the Lord said what are you doing here this is not what I called you to do it's, it's the voice that leads you you know uh, but I was just had a good idea to do something for God but his spirit when his spirit's in you he will speak to you his voice will lead you into the work he's called you to do and this is part of it you know this teaching idea is part of it you know I, I go to work every day and uh, as a house painter and after 35 years of doing this work I've met a lot a lot a lot of people and many times uh, people I've never met before new people new faces and God has me through the power of the Holy Spirit either pray for their sick or you know preach the gospel tell them my story my testimony and now God has given me these teachings on video and it's all part of listening to him and just doing what he says it's not it doesn't have to be this great big work that the whole world recognizes and sees you on nationwide television or whatever or you build this huge humongous church uh, or hospital you know or food kitchens or whatever uh, go do that if you want but that's not being a lot of the world uh, the light of the world is the power of the Holy Spirit working through you and in you, changing you, but through you, healing others and bringing salvation and the miracle power of God through others, to others. This is the light of the world. So Abraham couldn't wait much longer. So we, he went ahead and you know, tried to carry out the promise of God through Ishmael. And so we're going to go on to chapter... 21 and finally Sarah has the child God promised uh, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken this is Genesis 21 verse 1 and Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had told him and Abram, Abram called the name of his son that was born unto him, who Sarah bore, Isaac. And Abram circumcised his son, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, so that all that hear me will laugh with me. And she said, Who, who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck, for I have borne him? A son in his old age and the child grew and was weaned and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned and Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian which she had born to Abraham mocking him so Isaac and then he she says wherefore she says to Abraham cast out this bondwoman and her son for the son of the bondwoman which was Ishmael shall not be heir with my son Isaac so there's trouble in the camp for Abraham you know, he had this Ishmael, and then when God fulfilled his word that he had promised, he gave Sarah, Abraham was a hundred, Sarah was, it says somewhere in here, uh, to save time, you can read through it and find it, but I know she was in her 90s, uh, Sarah was. Um, so, I mean, it was past her age to bear children, so it was a miracle. God gave him a miracle. That's what he wants to do with us. It's miracles he wants to do, uh, things we can't do. You know, we can go have a child with, uh, you know, uh, our, our slave woman like he did. But, you know, to have a child at 90-something years old was a miracle. So God wants to wait on him for, for, to do the miracle and not run to man to, to, to help us out. Um, but as soon as the child with Isaac was born, Ishmael started persecuting him. Uh, and that's, it it's, talks about that in the New Testament. I'll go there. But, um, so, Sarah talks... Abraham into putting out the woman and her Ishmael, which he does. He has to send, uh, give them food and water, and send them out of the camp, uh, which was Agar and Ishmael, sent them out into the world. And they became a great nation, which is the nation of Islam, uh, which is a religion. But, um, you know, this is where, this is the Ishmael today in the world, still persecuting the Jews, still persecuting Isaac. So, I mean, be careful what you, uh, careful with your Ishmaels. They may come back to haunt you. That's why it's always best to just wait on God to do His miracle that He has spoken to you about. So, this is it. This is um, His second test. 
uh, to wait on God to fulfill His promise and not try to take it into His own hands to do it. And, you know, God uh, always picks up the slack in our life when we can't quite uh, wait on the Lord. He will, you know, He doesn't abandon us. He works it out in the end. But it's always best, you know, to just trust Him for what He's promised He would do to us and make us into. And then, um, so he has to send Ishmael out of the camp. So I want to go to the New Testament and see what they say about this. This is in Galatians. Uh, Paul talks about this Hagar and this Sarah. And that's in Galatians 4. So if you go to Galatians 4. And I think it's around verse 21. Let's see. I'm reading it in the King James. Uh, I looked at it in the Living Bible, but sometimes uh, they just kind of over-translate it for you. And when they do that, they kind of say what they think it means. So I'm just going to read it in the, the rough. I know that the King James Version is pretty rough. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, their, their English, their, the uh, King James English. But a lot of times by reading it, that you, you leave it open for the Holy Spirit to, to give you the interpretation and not somebody else's. I, I use other translations, but sometimes when I you know, don't quite see it that way, I read in the King James and let the Spirit you know, open up and understand it. But Galatians 4, Paul says in 22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bond or slave maid, the other by a free woman or his wife, Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. Ishmael was born after the flesh. What your flesh can do. But the free woman was by the promise. But he of the free woman, in other words, but the child that was born of Sarah was by the promise. So the child that was born of the slave woman was born after, you, after the strength of your own flesh. But the child that was born after Sarah, the free woman, was by promise. The promise God had made. Which things, these things are an allegory for us. And an allegory is like a type and a shadow, a prototype. For us to look back, there's a scripture that says, Everything in the Old Testament was written down and carried out for us today to see their mistakes and not do the same thing over again. Okay? So these things are for an allegory. But these speak about the two covenants that God has. One from Mount Sinai, which is the bondwoman, which is Hagar. The other one is Jerusalem from above. So it says, let me read that again. These things are an allegory. These are the two covenants. One from Mount Sinai, which is bondage, which is Hagar. And answers to Jerusalem, which is below. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Okay, that is kind of complicated, to, you know, in a way. But reading the other translations, some of it does are correct when I read it. So it's like an allegory about the two covenants. One is of your flesh. You know, God gave the old covenant, and, and he did it because that's what we'll, we'll get into Moses and, and when God called him out of Egypt, how he met with all of them, and he, they heard his voice, but they didn't want that. They wanted religion like the other nations. They built statues as soon as Moses came down from the mountain. They had statues of a gold calf because they saw that's what the Egyptians, how they worshipped their God. But God wanted an individual relationship and they didn't want it. So he worked with them through the laws and through the priesthood and the sacrifices until Christ came. So the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was like Hagar. Okay, It's what the flesh can do for God. And it failed. They finally came to when Christ came, they finally realized that this is failing. You know, we can't keep God's laws. We have to keep just sacrificing animals because of our failures. You know, and they finally got fed up to where they were, well, some of them received Jesus Christ to give them power to live the way God wanted and not trying to do it with their own flesh. But the first covenant was all of the flesh, which was Ishmael, a type of, a type of Ishmael, prototype. But the new covenant, is this city, Jerusalem, from above. There's a Jerusalem from below, it says, and there's a Jerusalem from above. The Jerusalem from below is the Old Covenant. The Jerusalem from above, which is New Jerusalem, in Revelations, 
there's a city of God called New Jerusalem. This is not rebuilding, you know, what they're doing in the Middle East, you know, God said he destroyed the nation of Israel. It's America and Great Britain that put it back together after the World War. God didn't have nothing to do with that. God said when he destroyed the nation of Israel, the physical nation of Israel, he started a new nation of Israel, which is a spiritual nation, not something you see with your eyes in a place in the Middle East, in a land in the Middle East. That was the Old Covenant. It's the United States and Great Britain that had that, that, that did that for us. It wasn't God. God destroyed that nation and he built a new covenant of people we're his Jews all born-again Christians are the Jews of God his city that cannot be seen with these eyes is the new Jerusalem and that is like I said before it is it is people in all walks of life in every denomination that actually hear his voice and follow him and do miracles and he works miracles in their life this is the new Jerusalem this is the new city of God that can't be seen with these eyes in a physical location. So it says it right here. The Jerusalem from above, which is Sarah, is an example of that. Sarah is an example of doing it by his spirit. Hagar is an example of doing it with our own physical flesh and strength. And we can't carry out what God promised to us in our own strength. You know, we have to, he has to call us, we have to surrender, he has to fill us with his Holy Spirit and all the gifts of power of the Spirit. You know, then he has to make us a new person through our lifetime. And then we are the light of the world through the power of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I mean, he has to do all that. We just have to yield to him. Yield to the voice we're hearing. Yield to the spirit that's in us when he wants to work in our hands to heal or in our thought life to give us a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. I'll give a teaching one day maybe on all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the last scripture I'm going to read is Hebrews chapter 11. Talking about the city Abraham was looking for. He was 11 verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should have to receive for inheritance, he obeyed. He went out not knowing where he went. By faith, he lived in a land of promise, in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, tents, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of that same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker was God, or is God. So he looked for a city that wasn't a visible one, whose builder was God. God is rebuilding. God is restoring this building of individuals who are his temple, who are transformed in their spirit, soul, and body to serve him. And Abraham didn't understand that, but he was looking for it. He was looking for this city. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past the age because she judged God's faithful who had promised. And then the final test was Isaac. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, let's see. Okay, let me go back one. Uh, but now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called our God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried up again, offered up Isaac on the altar. And he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. So I think it's in chapter 22 of Genesis, or 23. His final test was offering up his son that God gave him on the altar. And that God would give him back to him again. And we'll cover that next week. So, he offered up his only son in the last test, and God spared him and gave him back. And I'm going to cover that, uh, uh, the test of Abraham and Isaac, on my next teaching. So read that in uh, Genesis chapter 22 and 23. And we will cover that next week. Okay, thank you.